And that even when sometimes it seems other people or even Satan is in control, ultimately only God is in control, not other people. Well, can we take a few cues from David, this emotional man who in other places of scripture, well, he was kind of an emotional hothead, uh, act before you think kind of guy rather than a think before you act. In fact, he would try to fix outcomes and position people just in a way that made everything work out for him, even going as far as to have a man killed so he could have his wife. That's found in 2 Samuel chapter 11. So what transformed David from this control freak who would stop nothing short of murder to get his way into a man whom scripture says was a man after God's own heart? I think it's because David learned the fine art of soul control, of bossing his heart around. Soul control is when we speak God's truth to ourselves. Soul control is when we recognize that life isn't fair and sometimes it's going to seem like the wicked are prospering when the righteous are flailing about. Soul control is when we pause to remember our place and God's place. Soul control is when we idle our brain before we engage our mouth, thereby saving ourselves a lot of heartache, broken relationships, and even regret. Soul control is when we stop sometimes mid-sentence and we realign our thinking with God's word. Soul control, S-O-U-L, is when we realize that it is only God who has soul control, S-O-L-E. Not other people, not ourselves, and not even Satan. Soul control is a fresh dose of perspective amidst the turmoil of life that can transform a control freak woman who has wounded with her words, maybe only, but killed nonetheless, and to a woman who, like David, is someone after God's own heart. And finally, soul control not only changes us, it can change other people too. If we will learn to practice it in our own life, and back off and let God work in their life. If you remember the story of my daughter, we last left her stranded in a snowstorm in a hotel in the middle of nowhere. Well, I knew that I was out of control. I couldn't fix it like I could when she was little, but I could call in the troops for prayer. So I got on an email and I sent an email out to all of the group that I have, the speaking team from my ministry, Proverbs 31 Ministries. A lot of them live in the North Carolina area, though none of them live there because she had traveled almost three, four hours by the time she got stranded. But I knew I could ask for them for prayer. I could count on them to storm heaven's gates on behalf of my baby girl. So I got some emails back that people were praying. Well, one girl, she texted me, a girl on our team who's actually not from Charlotte. She's from Atlanta, Georgia, Whitney Caps, And she said... What town is she in? And I said, I don't know. Let me text her. I'm like, Mackenzie, what town are you in? And she said, like, I don't know. And I said, call the hotel front desk and say, where am I? So we found out the name of the little town, and I texted back to Whitney and told her the name. And she said, you're not going to believe this, but I'm scheduled to speak at an event in two weeks right near that little town. Let me call the pastor of the church. So she got on the, the phone. She called the pastor. He and his wife the next morning, after Mackenzie had spent one night in the hotel, they went and picked her up. And they kept her for two days because the weather didn't turn nice again and melt the snow for two whole days. So she was stranded there that entire time because there weren't salt trucks and there weren't plows. It all worked out happily ever after. They helped her get her car out of impound because it was taken because she had abandoned it on the highway. They got her on her way and back to her home in Charlotte. And I thought, oh, good. That's all done. I learned my lesson. I need to just calm down and control my soul. And she learned her lesson. She'll only do it once, right? <laughs> but neither of those things were the lessons God had for us. I needed to learn to back off and let God work in her life. And she, well, she had another lesson she needed to learn. Because one thing I failed to tell you when I told you when this happened was that what was going on in the world at that time, just three days earlier, had been the devastating earthquakes in Haiti. And my daughter, about three days after she got home, 
she hopped on her little blog that she keeps and she wrote this. She was picking up the story just after she'd rigged up the Yankee traction and gotten the two gentlemen out of the snowbank. She said, we actually began to move again. However, it didn't last long. Suddenly, the highway was dead. With over six inches of snow around us and no sign of movement, people were getting impatient and finally emerging from their cars. There were so many accidents that the interstate and all exits were now completely closed until further notice. Many were abandoning their cars to try to get to safety. With my gas gauge almost to empty, I decided the best thing to do would be to abandon my car too and walk. Walk with all my belongings for the weekend to the nearest hotel. And so I began my hike. I met a girl on the way and we got to talking. But then, as our fingers began to go numb on our nearly three mile walk, and our chattering voices fell silent. However, my thoughts piped up. You see, in my head, I was going over all of my many complaints. My feet were cold. I couldn't feel my hands. My nose was running. My shoulder really hurt from carrying my stuff. I might not be able to see my friends. I was hungry. The usual self-centered I and me statements. But suddenly, I began to think about all of the things I was carrying. My coach purse my parents got me for my 18th birthday. My MacBook Pro laptop I had just bought with my graduation open house money. My new Nikon camera. My clothes. My cell phone. And as I did, a picture popped into my whining and complaining mind. I thought about all the people in Haiti. They were in the same boat as me, only worse. You see, they don't have any of those nice things to carry. They can't walk a few miles to a waiting warm bed. They don't have clean water. They can't even pay 10 bucks for an overpriced salad at the hotel restaurant. I began to realize that I am blessed. We are all blessed, even when things don't go as we planned, even when we have to walk in the cold, in over half a foot of snow, for three miles, still, we are blessed. When we can't control our circumstances or the circumstances of others, we can learn, like David, to practice the fine art of soul control. Soul control allows us not only to learn the lessons God has for us, but it also prevents us from getting in the way of the lessons he's trying to teach other people in our lives. Soul control S-O-U-L, will give God soul control, S-O-L-E. And then we can learn, just like David did, how to be someone who isn't trying to run the show. We're trying instead to learn to walk in faith.